the TUC before moving to local government. After years of representing Hayes and Harlington in the GLC, he was elected their Member of Parliament in 1992. In Parliament, his commitment to working people and trade unions has been total. He has opposed privatisation of our public services. He's been a tireless voice against cuts. And, of course, he fought tooth and nail against the dreadful Trade Union Act. So now I'm really delighted, really delighted that we'll work with trade unions to improve the lives and rights of working people. John, it's an absolute pressure. Thanks, Please sorry. take the stage. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, um, thanks. Thanks, brothers and sisters. Look, I'm, I'm a bit late because the train in front of us broke down. So I speak on behalf of the nation with an appeal for Theresa May. Please do not allow Chris Grayling near any government department ever again in the history of this country. Can I thank Sally for the introduction? It was very kind of her. I listened to Sally's speech on Sunday taking us through the 150th year history of the TUC. Throughout the last 150 years. And as, as Sally has said, I, I came off the shop floor myself and I worked for the NUM and then I joined the TUC at Congress House as a researcher. And I've, I've always been immensely proud of my trade union origins. And I'll tell you, this is an honor an honour to be invited to address Congress. And I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. As Jeremy and I have repeatedly said, the trade unions founded the Labour Party. Never again should there be a Labour leadership that looked upon the trade union link as some form of anachronistic embarrassment. We are one movement. We are one movement, the Labour and Trade Union movement, and we will always be, and we will always stand together. Strangely enough, I was at, um, I think it was a retirement do of one of my former TAUC colleagues a couple of years ago, and she reminded everyone that when I was at Congress House, I set up a reading club, a reading group, and it met once a week in the basement at Congress House. She only had one complaint, and that the only book we ever read was Das Kapital. <laughs> Look, this week is the 10th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the start of the financial crash overall. And I remember it as if it was yesterday. What followed were the crises in Northern Rock, RBS. Someone recently dug out a film of the interviews and speeches I did at the, in the TV in the Commons at the time. And as the banks teetered on the edge, I called upon Alistair Darling, who was then the Chancellor, to nationalise the banks to stabilise them. And he initially delayed, but eventually nationalisation was implemented. And I always remember Alistair had a dry sense of humour, so when I got up in the Commons to welcome nationalisation, his response was, well, I've been calling for the nationalisation of the banks for 30 years, so I was bound to be right at least on one occasion during that period. But let's be clear, the financial crash was caused by the deregulation of the banking system, the finance sector and greed. And it turned the city into a giant casino. And here's the irony for me, the money that we pumped in to save the system through positive easing inflated assets, asset prices and many of the very speculators whose reckless gambling caused the crisis actually benefited from it. The election of the Conservative government in 2010 meant that it wasn't those speculators who caused the crisis who would eventually pay for it. The Conservatives made the choice that it would be the rest of us, especially some of those most vulnerable within our society. So, ten years on, after eight years of grinding austerity, in the sixth richest country in the world, I find it a disgrace that there are 5,000 of our fellow citizens sleeping on the streets every night. I find it, 
I find it unacceptable. I find it unacceptable that 70,000 of our children have been brought up in temporary accommodation, never having a permanent roof over their heads. There's a million people now who are not recently receiving the social care they need. And over a million food parcels handed out to our people last year from the food banks because they haven't even the means to feed themselves. There are four million of our children now living in poverty. And what's particularly telling is that two-thirds of those children are in households where someone's at work. What does that tell you? It says wages are so low that they no longer, for many people, cover the basics in life. The Tories talked about those who are just about managing. Yes, there are issues there, but there's some people out there who are just about surviving. The Conservatives have been boasting the last few days again about the number of jobs in the economy. What they don't tell you is how many are low paid, insecure, on zero hours contracts. Well, we know why, don't we? We know why they're insecure. We know why they're low paid. It's because year after year under Conservative governments there's been attacks on trade union rights. And the role of Conservative go governments throughout history has always been to restrict the rights of workers so they can maximise the profits of some companies. And they're the companies that so generously fund their party. It's a straight quid pro quo. The Conservatives try and dress it up as some form of restoring or securing a balance of power between workers and employers, but few today can argue that the balance hasn't been overwhelmingly tipped against the workers, as concluded in the recent IPPR report supported by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the result is that the amount of national income going to wages has actually now reached record lows. The massive growth in zero-hour contracts and the gig economy have produced a workplace environment of insecurity not seen since the 1930s. My father was a Liverpool docker, and my grandfather was a Liverpool docker. In the 1930s, they were those dockers that used to go outside the dockyard and wait on the street to be pointed at to see if they worked that day, and if they didn't, there were no wages. Well, zero-hour contracts and bogus self-employment simply replicate that system in a modern form, and we can't tolerate it anymore. And the decline of collective bargaining has meant workers now have little say often over key decisions taken by their employers over the future of their work and of their companies as well. So let me make it absolutely clear. When Ra Labour returns to government, the anti-trade union era will end. And if it's up to me, it will end once and for all. Our programme of workplace reform will restore the balance between employer and worker. And it will do so by, yes, installing basic trade union rights in law again, modernising corporate government structures, and by extending the opportunity for employees to share collectively in the benefits of ownership of their company, their concern. And this is how we'll do it. The government at the moment, I think, is rapidly being destabilised by the bitter internal disputes within the Tory party. And I believe an election can come at any time. So we're now going through an exercise, a preparation for government exercise. We're preparing for every policy in our last manifesto, and yes, the new policies we're now developing, an implementation manual. And we're getting the draft legislation on the shelf. And yes, we're consulting extensively on the new policy initiatives we're developing. And to install basic trade union rights in law, we published our 20-point plan and we're now working it up in detail. So in our first Queen's speech, let me give you this commitment. We will be setting up the new Department for Employment. The new Secretary of State for Employment in Cabinet will drive through a transformation of the workplace environment. Here's just part of it. We will fulfil the late John Smith's promise that all workers will have equal trade union rights from day one, whether they're part-time, full-time, temporary or permanent. We will,
zero hours contracts will be banned so that every worker gets a guaranteed numbers of hours each week. We'll repeal the act that I fought so hard against. We will repeal the Trade Union Act in our first 100 days and we'll roll out sectoral collective bargaining. All those other things we've discussed over the years. Trade unions will have the right of access to workplaces guaranteed. We'll introduce a real living wage, £10 an hour. And yes, unlike you, we believe that public sector workers deserve a decent pay rise and we support those unions still campaigning for a decent settlement now. I was asked in the media at my media huddle after Treasury questions about um, what would I be doing if there's further strikes on the railway industry this, uh, this winter and I said if there are they'll be provoked by management but the role of a Labour MP isn't just in Parliament it's on the picket line so I'll be on the picket line with you. We also will legislate to secure online and workplace balloting for industrial action votes and internal union votes. All those things we've simply made reasonable requests of this government and they've refused to respond. Yes, we'll abolish employment tribunal pleas so people have access to justice again. And we'll prioritise the strengthening of protections for women against unfair redundancy. No one should be penalised for having children. And we will tackle the gender pay gap once and for all. In addition, our government will clamp down on the bogus self-employment that we've seen developed. And yes, we'll ban the payroll companies, the umbrella companies that have been developed in recent years. And one way of, one way of using public spending to drive up standards will be this. We will include in conditions in public contracts that companies will only get those contracts if they recognise a trade union representing their workers. And just on something again which I've been dealing with personally maybe over the last 20 odd years and maybe more, we'll hold the public inquiry into blacklisting so that we ensure that blacklisting never ever comes back again. Since we, since we published that 20-point plan, there's been the Taylor Report. And the answers to the gig economy, to be frank, won't be found in the Taylor Report or the months of consultation that have taken place. Because the report's starting point is that flexibility must come at the price of insecurity. This is just wrong. Just because you don't work regular hours doesn't mean you can afford not to work when you're sick. Just because you work several jobs doesn't mean you can afford to lose one of them without warning. And just because you value the freedom of independence or the convenience of flexibility, it doesn't mean you have to forego basic trade union rights. So our manifesto, for the many not the few, we published nine months before the Taylor Review, the Taylor Report, and it contained a set of policies that would put a complete stop to the exploitation in the gig economy. First, we'll shift the burden of proof so that the law treats you as a worker unless your employer can prove otherwise. Second, we'll extend full rights to all workers, so that includes so-called limb workers, entitling everyone in insecure work to sick pay, maternity rights, and the right against unfair dismissal, and that again will be from day one. And third, we will properly resource HMRC, and yes, we will fine employers who break the rules so that people get the rights they're entitled to. And I say when employers, and they will, you know this, when they continue to employ legal loopholes or weak enforcement to duck their responsibilities, we will close those legal loopholes and we'll strengthen enforcement and we'll work alongside the TUC to do that. And when technology create, creates new employment relations, yes, we extend regulation to keep pace with your advice in our ears. And when the balance of power shifts so dramatically away from work as it has done today, it's time for us to tip it back in the direction of the workers. So I think taking that with all our other commitments, what we're about to see and when Labour goes into power is the biggest extension 
of individual collective rights our country has ever seen. It will transform irreversibly the workplace and our working lives. And right at the heart of it is the principles of trade unionism. Even if the government adopted every recommendation of the Taylor report, it wouldn't be enough. It's because Taylor ignored the crucial history lesson that we've learned, that the most effective way of improving the lives of working people, well, you know it, join a trade union, participate in collective action, and work that way. When we go into government as well, you know we'll have to work together to rebuild our economy. And I'll just give you a few stark figures that will demonstrate what we're likely to inherit. And they may well have come up in your debate already. You know as well as I do, wages are still below the level of 2010. Investment in 2017 was the lowest of all G7 nations on share of GDP. We've had the slowest recovery since modern records began. We're the only major economy where wages fell or the GDP grew. Research and development investment amongst the lowest in Europe. Use of robotics, we're the 22nd in the world. Productivity gap, 16% between the UK and the rest of the G7. These statistics demonstrate a record of economic mismanagement and failure. And we have an economy now that is supported by record levels of household debt. I'm grateful now for the supports, the ideas, the creativity our trade union partners have brought to our, well now, the detailed economic planning that we're undertaking. Step by step, we're working together on the economic and industrial strategy we need to build the future, to build the future. First, the first step, we need to clear away the debris of the past privatisations that are ripping off both consumers and taxpayers and, yes, exploiting workers. So we've told you, yes, we'll bring back into public ownership rail, water, Royal Mail, and we'll develop our own community energy sector as well. And I want to say to Dave Prentice as well, as well, who first raised the concerns of PFI through Congress and into the Labour Party as well. We will end PFIs, and yes, we're going to start the process now of bringing them back into public ownership and control, as well as the staff themselves who deserve the protections against the vulnerabilities they've experienced. And we've... And we've also said very, very clearly that when when we bring these services back into public ownership and control, the management of these services in future will always involve representatives of the workforce via their trade unions. Who better to ask in how to manage a service than those at the front line represented by their trade unions? That's the first step. The second step is the investment we need to, we need to undertake. We recognise the scale of the investment we need if we're to rebuild our economy. That's why we put forward a, what we call the National Transformation Fund of £250 billion mainstream funding through government departments. It's why we will set up a national investment bank alongside regional development banks, again, to lever in another £250 billion over that 10-year period. £500 billion invested over 10 years in our infrastructure, road and rail, digital, research and development, and yes, alternative energy sources. A figure supported by the CBI, who again, we're working alongside to develop our proposals. And what these will do, these resources will be invested to modernise our economy and make us fit for what you've been debating this week, make us fit for the fourth industrial revolution. And they'll be directed by our industrial strategy. Trade unions already are and will be throughout our period of office at the heart, the very heart, of developing and implementing our industrial strategy. A few months ago, one of my advisors, Graham Turner, I've worked with over the last 15 years, he's an advisor in the city, we asked him to produce a report on the future of the finance sector, but also how we will secure the investment that our economy needs. And he, we published that report a couple of months ago. And it recommended the establishment of a strategic investment board 
to harness and direct investment, bringing together the Bank of England, the Treasury, the Business Department, business, but also representatives of the trade union movement. That SIB will enable us then democratically to manage our economy and ensure that we have the investment we need for the 21st century. And on skills, alongside the capital investment, we need the skills and the public services to ensure that we have a productive workforce. That's why, as you know, we've put out the proposals for consultation to introduce a national education service. We're, first of all, ending the cuts in education. We're going to make sure we properly fund our schools and colleges, and yes, teachers will be supported rather than oppressed in the way that they are at the moment. And that means investment in the long term. We believe in education as a gift from one generation to another, not a commodity to be bought and sold, so that's why we're scrapping tuition fees. Our ambition is to achieve an education service like the NHS, free at the point of need, from cradle to grave, providing world-class education, and yes, we'll be developing alongside that our proposals for childcare. And the NES, the National Education Service, like all our investments in the NHS, local government, and all our public services, will be paid for by a fair taxation system. Yes, we've said we'll raise taxes, income tax, on the top 5%. Not a lot, but we will. We've reversed some of the corporation tax cuts that the Tories have introduced which have failed because they've cut the taxes to the corporations and yet they're sitting on £700 billion of earned income not invested. And yes, we'll introduce what some of you have been campaigning for for years. You called it a Tobin tax. We're going to introduce a financial transaction tax on the City of London so they pay their way to fund our public services. And we're going to tackle tax evasion and tax avoidance that goes on the industrial scale at the moment. You know, during the last general election campaign, the Tories kept on accusing me of having a magic money tree. I found the magic money tree. It's in the Cayman Islands. We're going to dig it up and we're going to bring it back here. As, as we rebuild our economy, we insist that everyone shares in that prosperity that we will generate. And yes, by better wages, of course. But also we want to extend ownership. So we're committed to doubling the cooperative sector within our economy. We're going to give workers the right to buy when their company is sold on. And this week we've launched a consultation on inclusive ownership funds. It's an idea brought to us by the co-op and is developed elsewhere right the way across Europe. This will give workers a direct stake in their company and will legislate to create a new workers' fund for each large corporation which will place a part of that corporation directly into the collective ownership and control of the workforce. These funds will grow over time and mean workers getting a say in the management and direction of the company like every other shareholder. And you know, research has proved time and time again that worker-owned companies do better for paying conditions, but are also more productive and they invest for the long term and engage in long-term stability within the economy. So you can see this is a huge program of work that will transform our economy and the lives of all of our members. But yet it risks being jeopardised by the mess that this government is making over Brexit. We don't believe that Theresa May will be capable of bringing back from Brussels a deal that will pass the vital test of protecting jobs and our economy. In fact, it's doubtful she can bring back anything that can survive the bitter infighting in the Tory party itself. So we believe this. We believe we need a general election where any deal where any deal can be properly debated and people can choose the future negotiating team as well. 
like you, we haven't taken any option of democratic engagement off the table, but we have an overwhelming preference for a general election because we need our community, our members desperately need a Labour government. Whenever that general election comes, I'm confident that Jeremy Corbyn will be elected and into number 10. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping if he makes the right decision and the right appointment, we'll also have a socialist in number 11. That was a job application. <laughs> you've seen from the programme that we've put forward, you've seen from your debates that you've had this week, we have the opportunity of transforming our society, of building a new future. Some of my proudest moments over the last couple of years have been to see the new generation of trade unions come forward. I've been on the picket lines with the McDonald's workers, with the TGI Friday workers as well. This is the new generation coming forward. We've got to work with them to build this new future, this new society, where we eradicate the social injustices that the toys have inflicted upon us, where we build an economy where prosperity will be shared by all. And in solidarity, the Labour and Trade Union movement, the Labour Party and Trade Unions working together, I believe deep in my heart we will achieve that in solidarity. Solidarity. John is literally getting on the train and going right back down south again now. So um, it is so appreciated that you made the time. Safe journey, John, and we'll see you very soon. Thanks Take care.